Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my thanks to Bodo for the kind invitation to say a few words about the larger context of sensory history in the Cold War. I'm not going to take up much of your time, but I do wish to venture a few observations that I hope will help us make better sense of not just the Cold War, but of the larger importance, historical and historiographical, of the themes, at least from my perspective, that seem to be emerging from this very clever and very expertly conceived conference. I'm going to confess that my comments are also unabashedly self-serving, and not just for one, but for two reasons. The first um, is that Bodo and I have discussed the possibility of publishing all or part of these conference proceedings in an edited book in the Perspectives on Sensory History series that I edit at Penn State University Press. And this is a book historians of the senses not only want, but in fact need, uh, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Second, uh, some of what I'm going to say here pivots from two recent projects that I've been engaged in. One is a co-authored book with Rob Bodice entitled Emotion Sense Experience, and this was published last month in Jan Plumper's remarkably innovative series, Emotions and the Senses, with Cambridge University Press. And the other is a book I have coming out in the spring that I've called A Sensory History Manifesto. Uh, some of what I'm going to say today echoes the book Rob and I wrote, and it also prefaces what I'm going to say in the manifesto. I really have essentially two basic points I want to make. The first is that the study of the sensory Cold War will almost inevitably have to embrace emotions history if it is to fully unpack what Bodo so rightly describes as a war not only on the senses but through the senses. Uh, the second is that this entire enterprise, the entire conference, if you will, is a fascinating example of how we need sensory history. Um, especially for the post-World War II period. Uh, Bodo calls it a blatantly unexplored area, and he is emphatically right. If I had to title this series of remarks or this address, uh, I'd simply call it Redux, Time, Desire, Horror, because my intervention today takes as a starting point Alain Corbin's 1995 book, Time, Desire, Horror, Towards a History of the Senses. Uh, those three words, time, desire, horror, seem especially pertinent to this conference. The time in Corban's title suggests the power of the topic of the Cold War to stretch our chronological understanding of the senses. The desire and horror reminds us that sensory history, especially in this context, is perhaps inevitably also a history of emotion. So Corbin's Time, Desire and Horror is a unique book, and quite a brilliant one at that. Uh, chief among its qualities is an effort to explicitly theorize the history or the writing of the history of the senses, which he details in his chapter History and Anthropology of the Senses, itself arguably one of the earliest sustained meditations on the methodology of sensory history. Clues to his larger thinking are also apparent in the book's title, Time, Desire, Horror. The senses he suggests here are intimately linked to emotions. Horror, desire, any number of emotions were indexed to sensory experiences and hitched to a particular specific context. Uh, there is no other way, he says, to know men of the past than by trying to borrow their glasses and to live their emotions. And it is this emphasis on the relationship between the senses and emotions that I think will help us examine with profit the sensory history of the Cold War. And now plainly, historical research dedicated to just the senses or just emotions will continue, and I think that's entirely appropriate. We will continue to benefit from discrete studies of various emotions and senses in particular contexts. But alongside that specialised work, historians of emotion and historians of the senses will increasingly need to read one another's work with care, simply to better understand why, say, a particular sensory habit or emotional register 
emerged at a particular time in a given way. Uh, we need to better appreciate the braiding between the senses and emotions and that understanding is most likely to emerge if a sustained dialogue between the two fields is established and cultivated. Now reading between the lines of the titles of the various papers for this conference I think that the connection is there. I can't know for sure but I suspect that handmaiden to olfactory forms of Cold War warfare was the emotion of fear and anyone who has read Steve Goodman's Sonic Warfare will likely find that his ecology of fear also applies to the historical acoustomology as well as to the olfactory history of the Cold War. What other emotions were at play with each sense? Again, it's hard to say, but I'd be amazed if the papers on taste and gustation didn't also, even implicitly, deal with the emotions of disgust on the one hand and happiness and contentment on the other. And surely the fascinating discussion of sensory deprivation experiments is at once a story of sensory emotional highs and lows. So too with propaganda. After all, that's a way to influence emotion through the senses. And indeed, the very word cold, as part of the Cold War, is deeply implicated in both tactility and emotion. And we should take the meaning and history of that word and its various implications and mediations quite seriously. So if desire and horror help us think profitably about the Cold War, so does the other element in Corban's title, Time. And here I understand times in terms of chronology and how this conference helps us move beyond conventional temporal categories and even periodizations. If sensory history has taught us anything, it is, it is that the Enlightenment did not elevate sight to the utter exclusion of the other senses, and that the non-visual senses were not only important to key developments in the modern world, but constitutive of them. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that the writing of sensory history now consistently and correctly challenges the central point of the Great Divide theory, the idea that the Enlightenment elevated sight and downplayed the other senses to the point of only nominal relevance. And I think that um, we, we make this point so often that it's almost implicit in what we're doing. Now given that this tendency will doubtless continue, I suspect that we will see, and properly so, work on both the continued relevance of so-called forgotten senses, such as intuition, um, in the post-Enlightenment era, and more work devoted to the modern period, especially for the post-World War II years. And in truth, we already possess helpful signposts, although they're not always from historians of conflict. Um, a sensory history of the Cold War could benefit from work on environmental disasters, not least because they sometimes share a very contemporary and certainly post-World War II chronology. I'm thinking here of Joy Parr's magnificent and certainly groundbreaking study on the sensory impact and experience of Canadian mega-projects, which are both environmental and part and parcel of the Cold War. Because she looks at large dam construction, the building of nuclear plants, and the establishment of military bases. And she looks really at the period 1953 to 2003. And I think that Parr's book is, chronologically at least, among the most recent analyses of the modern period generally, at least until now, thanks to this conference. Focusing on this post-World War II period offers many dividends to the sensory historian. The sheer scale of late 20th century industrial development offers us a unique opportunity to understand sensory limits and the ways in which people's senses were not only made but remade by both wars and huge environmental change. And as Pa also notes, some of these changes courted environmental disasters that were not always detectable by the senses. Tainted water, for example, eluded the eye, nose and tongue and called into question the very reliability of the modern human sensorium. Plainly, whatever the particulars of the post-World War II period era, this work shows that it is no longer helpful to think of the Enlightenment as a moment in which the non-visual senses were eclipsed in favour of the eye.
It seems to me that there are two main dividends uh, to studying the post-World War II period, and of the wars in particular, both hot and cold, and environmental disasters from an historical sensory perspective. First, wars and environmental disasters not only heightened and deadened and stretched the senses, but also created a sensory recognition that smells and touches and tastes and sounds assumed a much greater salience than they do under ordinary conditions. Indeed, wars especially, especially the modern industrial ones, seem to share certain sensory signatures. They often muddle the certainty of vision, possess a certain atavistic quality, whereby the presumed lower senses of smell, touch and taste take on a much greater significance than conventional pre-existing sensory protocols typically permit, take on a volume and intensity that is unusual, and importantly, linger long after the moment has passed. A second benefit to studying sensory extremes, or the senses under extreme circumstances, is that, an approach, is that such an approach reveals with precision the historical uniqueness of the sensory experience. The sensory experience of war or environmental disaster cannot be reproduced simply because of the scale and capriciousness of these events, but also because, as with all other sensory experiences, they occur in context. The smell of thousands of dead bodies, human and animal, cannot, and ethically should not, be reproduced or reconsumed, and I think this is a question very much alive for Cold War studies too. We wouldn't want to reproduce or re-experience the Cold War, um, and I wonder why historians of earlier wars uh, sometimes uh, want to endorse such an approach. So the ways that the senses functioned in war and under duress point to the utter need, really, for a contextual reading of sensory evidence. There is, of course, much more I could say, but I'm going to leave it there. And I'm really looking forward to these papers, and I will tell you that I really haven't been as excited about a conference um, on sensory history for a very long time. And so good luck, and I look forward to reading uh, your comments and your thoughts.